We are joined today by John Michael Greer, who I was just saying backstage. So John and I have spoken once before, about 18 months ago, I think, on a Techno Social podcast. But uh, we're here on Parallax now with uh, with Andrew Sweeney. And people who have been following know that we've been quite interested in the tarot for some of the sessions earlier this year. And, uh, and so I thought I'd invite John in to talk a little bit about the tarot and about divination um, I had a hunch it's something he might know one or two things about. Um, so welcome, John Michael Greer. Um, I think first question, maybe just a simple one to warm things up is what are we talking about when we're talking about the art of divination? Okay, that's that, that's a great one of one of those uh, great bucket questions that you know the further down you go, the more complicated it gets. Um, the sort of simple pop culture notion of divination is that it's a way of fortune telling, a way of finding out what the future holds. Um, that of course begs a flotilla of philosophical questions: Does the future exist already, or what? Um, I don't know that anyone has a single canned definition for divination that everyone accepts. The definition that I use is that it's a way of catching patterns in what we can call the unseen or the spiritual realm uh, before they manifest in the material world. It is not foolproof. It is certainly not omniscient. But very often it's a way of sensing both um, things that have not happened yet and things that have happened but that for one reason or another you can't find out about. Um, it uses intuitive skills. It uses a range of mental skills, in fact, that we don't typically put much stress on in modern industrial societies. And um, there are lots of different ways to do it. Mm. I like that thing you said. So a way to sense things that have happened perhaps in the spirit world or the immaterial world before they happen in the material world. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. expand a little bit, a bit on what sure. you mean there or what is implied by that? Okay. The, one of the basic concepts of Western esoteric spirituality is that the material world that we experience with our ordinary senses is a world of effects. It is not a world of causes. The causes are in the spiritual realms, and that's realms plural, by the way, um, from the Gnostics right down to the present day. Most Western esoteric traditions understand there are actually various realms in the unseen, various spiritual modes of being that all relate to one another in various complicated ways. But patterns in those realms will gradually take shape in the material realm. They shape what happens here, and so if you can catch them before they've, um, you know, before they've materialized, you can sense in many cases what's going to happen. I mean, this this is true even in a very straightforward practical sense. Um, if if somebody is going to be, let's say, um, building a house, we can imagine um, an architect. Okay, first the architect has an idea for what he wants the house to look like, and then you know that gradually gets developed. You get blueprints. You get um, you know, the various construction orders and things. And at any of those stages, if you can catch sight of what's going on, if you can get the architect drunk and you know, talk to them about the, build, the house they want to build, or you look at the blueprints or check out the construction orders or what have you, you can get a pretty good idea of what the house is going to look like when it's done, even though the house is still in the future. And, you know, in the same way. If you can get a sense of what the patterns are that are, in, to use a cult jargon, moving down the planes toward material manifestation, you can get a sense of how they're likely to work out once they actually land in the realm of matter. Mm. So maybe that brings us nicely into the tarot as one way of making sense of the mm -hmm. pattern. Mm -hmm. It's... Yeah, the thing is, there are, as I mentioned, there are many different kinds of divination, and a lot of them have the problem that you have to you have to kind of wait for a sign, or you have to hope that the sign that shows up is one that you can read. I think of the old Roman augurs who would set out um, waiting for a bird to fly past. Okay, what if all the birds went somewhere else? You'd be waiting there for a long time. The great advantage to what's called sortilage, and tarot is a variety of sortilage, is that you shuffle the cards and deal one. You know you're actually going to get a card, and for Furthermore, you know that it's going to be one of the 78 cards of the deck. You don't have to worry about, okay, what is the three-headed chicken? I don't, I haven't used that card. You know, you don't have some kind of strange symbol showing up out of nowhere, as often happens with dreams, let's say, or, or you know, suppose, I suppose a three-headed chicken could come flying overhead. But um, so you have a fixed set of symbols. Um, you know, sortilege systems vary in, in how many symbols they have. Tarot is kind of toward the upper end. Very few other oracles use as many as 78. And it's a set of cards. It's a deck of cards. And um, 
each of them has a certain meaning. You can, um, you know, shuffle and deal, and that that seemingly random act, quite reliably, gets you, if you will, omens, um, emblems, symbols that allow you to use your intuition to get a sense of what's what's en route. Mm. Do we have a sense of where the tarot came from? How much do we know? <laughs> oh, we, well, actually, we have uh, we is an interesting question here. Um, the origins of the tarot have been an amazing um, football game in, in either your sense or mine um, for quite some time now. In fact, we know exactly where they came from. Um, the, the, t- the first tarot deck, which was a little different from the current variety, was invented by a guy named Marziano de Tortona, who was the secretary of the Duke of Milan, sometime between, I think it was between 1411 and 1415. And there, there, were other, there were other things that led up to this, but he's the guy who put it together. He's the guy who came up with the idea of having, okay, we're going to have these four suits of regular cards, and then we're going to have a bunch of extra cards. We'll call them trumps. And, and, you know, here's our, here's our deck. And but that, that fact has been known by our Italian art historians since the late 19th century. But the problem is by the time they found that out, several other stories had gone into circulation. You will still find books today that insist the tarot dates from ancient Egypt. You will find books today that the claim that the, the tarot was invented by a convention of occultists in Fez, Morocco in the year 1200. You'll find various other things. I'm sure there must be someone out there who, tra- it, who traces, it, traces it back to ancient Atlantis. Um, I, it's, it's been a little while since I've seen that, but I'm sure it's out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of tendency to take um, old stories at face value. But in fact, it's a product of the Italian Renaissance. It was mm-hmm. it was generated in that era when symbolic imagery was understood perhaps better than ever before or since in the Western world, and when there was a lot of enormous creative energy flowing through society, and you know you had um, Leonardo doing paintings, and you had Michelangelo making doing sculptures, and you had various other people doing all kinds of other creative things, and then you had Marziano da Tortona catching the wave of creativity, and going, I know, this is going to be a really cool deck. So there we have it. Wow. So maybe I can I can jump in here and just ask a question about about that Go about ahead. the history because you know people like Alistair Crowley with his Toth tarot have, have been have taken a lot of liberties and have sort of oh, yeah. mixed the the Sifrat, the Jewish uh mm-hmm. Sifrat and 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 uh and then other things with, with the tarot and mm-hmm. so I wonder I wonder what the virtue of that are is, is there should be some sort of pure origin because no. i think a lot of maybe the <laughs> images there is no the images even if it was invented in the italian renaissance the images could have could have come from from before that so 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 you know how, how do you sort through all that like all okay. those endless uh, correspondences that that mm-hmm. you know that that alistair crowley uh, postulates mm-hmm. okay a uh, crow now crowley is coming late in our story um, because for, first of all, we had Marzio da, da, Marziano da Sotona. We had the various Italian um, tarot decks. We had um, tarot becoming a common card game in Italy, in um, France, some parts of France, in uh, Switzerland, and in some parts of Germany, where it's still very, very actively played today. You had people beginning to say, wow, this is neat. We can use this for divination. You had people saying, ooh, this must have been ancient Egyptian. Let's fix it. So it, you know, because it's obviously been debased from the ancient Egyptian form, and away we went. Tarot at this point, well, I don't think there ever was a single orthodox fixed set of tarot symbols. Certainly, Marziano, Marziano de Sotone, his symbols were not much like the ones that are being used now. And in fact, there's, um, in, in late Renaissance Italy, there was a tarot, a style of tarot that was used in Milan, there was a style of um, tarot that was used in Bologna. There were, I think most North Italian cities had their own styles with their own number of cards, their own images, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of looking toward this as some, you know, where is the original tarot? How can we look back to those, those you know, supposed um, primal images at the beginning of time? Um, it's become a very creative field. And, and Crowley and uh, Frida Harris, who was the artist, who uh, you know, he himself said she did most of what was worth having in that deck. Um, they were doing an abs- the absolute 
traditional, absolutely typical, absolutely creative thing of taking the basic concepts of the tarot, running with them, and doing something new and original with them. Um, going back to the, you know, let, let, let us, let's face it. I mean, if you really want a, a computer that works, do you really want a copy of the first computer? <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, probably not, unless you have a spare warehouse. And even so, you know, there's your Univac, you know, burning up electricity. And, you know, we've got to need, get, get some new relays to replace those and so on. And then it spits out the answer on paper tape. Um, this, is a, this is something that has been in the process of development, in the process of evolution, of unfolding for, for some centuries now. I don't think it's stopped yet. And there's no reason why it should. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you take this from a, from a spiritual standpoint, if there is a primal tarot, if there's an original tarot, it is not a physical object. It is a spiritual reality that is instantiated on the physical plane in various different ways, in various different times. Just, you know, Plato's metaphor, there is no perfect circle in the material world. And the first circle that was ever drawn by some, you know, some cave, caveman, you know, at Lascaux, that was not the one circle that everyone else, co everyone else copied. A circle is an archetype. The tarot is a set of archetypes. It's a particular concatenation of archetypes. People tune into those, express them in their own creative ways, and we get all these marvelous decks. Mm -hmm. So you think that the decks, there are decks that have more potency or reality to them or, or more more depth which are more like can we be more let's say uh i've got the french word fide fidelity have more fidelity to the archetypes well uh, like it, like it, how it, far can you go in your your in, you know and in, in, in terms of you know in terms of let's say keeping the tradition and and being uh, creative and what is that the it's my, in my in my repeated experience, and also the experience of one of my teachers who is heavily involved in the tarot, John, the late John Gilbert. Um, that's a personal thing. I know mm -hmm. people who get amazing readings with the baseball tarot. I can't baseball think tarot. at all. I, I, that that has no interest to me. I, I'm not a I'm not a baseball fan. Um, I know people who get great readings from tarot decks that I can't stand. I think they're ugly or, or cute and smarmy or various other things. Some of the decks that I have good results with, other people dislike intensely. Um, Alistair Crowley's Thoth deck is a great example. Some people adore it. It's like Marmite. You know, some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, <laughs> but the people who, who love it very often get very good results using it. Um, I find it I find it perfectly workable. It's not one of my faves, but it is very much a personal thing. As with so much archetypal material, it's not a matter of fidelity to the archetype because a physical thing cannot reflect the archetype in in any adequate fashion. It can only do so as experienced by an individual. It can only do so from a personal point of view. You know, your dreams are an expression of an archetype. They're they're great expressions for you. They're not the same as my dreams. Hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. So, which deck do you do you do you love, and, and why? Okay, um, I actually have several decks that I'm really into. Um, one deck that I've used an enormous amount, partly because it was it was my first deck, partly because it was um, a <clears throat> it was heavily used in one of the traditions, actually two of the traditions that I've studied intensely, is the Grand Old Rider Waite deck by Pamela and Cole and Smith's invention. Um, it's you know the the sort of Art Nouveau style, and um, it's it's a lovely deck. It people tend to forget how you know how 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 attractive it is, how revolutionary it was when it first came out, because it's become just the dominant deck in in certainly in the English speaking world. Um, Manly Polymer Hall and and Augustus, the artist Augustus Knapp created a very nice deck, the Knapp Hall deck, which I also I also find very useful. Um, there are several versions of Oswald Wirth's deck, which is in the, in the French tradition, and that's one that I like a great deal. Also, Jean Bouchard did quite some years ago now a Masonic tarot, um, which is which I I enjoy a great deal. It, it's very vivid in its colors, and the symbolism is very rich. Those are some of the ones that I really like. Mm, I think I remember reading, if I'm not mistaken, so do correct me if I'm wrong, somewhere in your writings on Eliphas Levy, the uh, recommendation that students get a copy of the Marseille deck to work with, um, mm -hmm. with his writings. Is that because that's 
what Levy himself is working with, and so it's about working with his teacher. The, the the specific bit in the in the in this the on, my ongoing discussion of Elvis Levy on my my monthly um, book club post on my blog is that either a Marseille deck or an Oswald Wirth deck or one a uh, copy of um, Manly P. Hall's deck. Because those three all use the symbolism from the French esoteric tarot tradition. And that's very much what um, what, what Levy was working with. Now, the Marseille deck, it was around before Levy. It was around before anyone thought there was anything particularly esoteric in tarot. Um, that's the one he had in mind. The Wirth deck and the and the uh, the the, the Nap Hall deck were created. Well, the, the Wirth deck is the model on which the Nap Hall is largely based, and that was created by a student of a student of Levy and um, a um, and, and a very a very close student of that end of of the esoteric tradition. So those those fit um, more precisely with the symbolism that Levy discusses. They relate to the teachings that he's trying to pass on, and so they're just more convenient for that kind of work. You won't get the same thing trying to pursue Levy if you're using the Rider Way or the Thoth deck or, or you know, any of these other English tradition decks. They just don't have the same symbols. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to change tack here slightly and uh, maybe okay. open up a little can of worms. No, I mean, it's still the same oh, topic. Oh, good. But, but, oh, good. Big, but, big, big cans of worms. Lots of worms. I'm yes. <laughs> let, let, let's, okay, let's go fishing. So, <laughs> so I've found in my own use of the tarot, right, that one of the tricky things is remembering what each of these goddamn cards means. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm probably not the first student who said that. And no. but I, I find myself wondering, is there, for example, in the uh, in the suit cards between numbers one to ten, regular sort of patterns associated with the various numbers so that I could know that, okay, say I'm seeing a four of chalices or a four of wands, that number four mm -hmm. is going to tell me something about how to read those cards. And mm -hmm. why it might be a can of worms is that we've got ten numbers, right? And so <laughs> And maybe well, let's go for a couple of the numbers and see how we start getting on. Yeah. Well, no, it's 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 quite simple actually. There are various schemes for doing that. Some derived from numerology, some derived from the Kabbalah, some derived from Pythagorean tradition. One of the one one of the awkward things about the tarot, about explaining the tarot, it's not awkward in use, it's actually very, very convenient in use, is that to some extent, the cards mean what you decide they mean. Because the card, you are, in your interaction with the cards, you're having a conversation with the cards. And the cards will respond to what's in your mind, since it's your intuition that's filtering all this stuff. Now, you know, th there are extents to which you can take that too far. You can take that to the point of trying to insist that the cards mean whatever you want, and so every reading tells you, yes, you're going to get everything you desire, in which case you'll have a lot of bad readings. But there's a fair amount of flexibility involved. And so the important thing seems to be to choose, uh, if you're going to have a scheme like that, a numerological scheme or what have you, choose one and stick with it. And so if you get, a, you draw a five of swords, do not suddenly decide the five, which you previously considered to be, you know, turbulence and disruption. That must mean perfect success because that's what I want. Don't go there. Uh, um, other than that, it is a, it's a very tangled question to what extent numerical symbolism is actually in the numbers, to what extent it's in the cultures, to what extent it's in the individual psyche. And I, I don't have an answer for that um, very, very difficult question. I do know that I, I originally trained to, uh, in the Golden Dawn tradition, and so I'm used to thinking of the numbers in Kabbalistic terms. And so that gave me, you know, from the beginning, a very convenient set of one, two, three, four, all the way through you know, one to ten. Each one has its, has its implied meaning. Each one has its its significance. And it was easy knowing that to say, oh, we got a five of swords. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be a steaming, yelling, um, contentious mess. Because that's what five means when you put it in, in the context of swords. Is that Gaborah five? At Gabura, exactly. Gabura, severity. Um, mm -hmm. The sphere of Mars. The sphere that whacks you over the head and says, don't be a moron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this is a good question, uh, actually, in terms of like what people project on it and, and, and their fears and, and, and how, how 
you can be messing around in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, there's there. I've had an experience w where I pulled out a card and it created a kind of chain reaction, you could say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, so I, I guess, I guess, I don't know what's my, my, what my question here is, is, is how do you, how do you deal with, let's say, like I can imagine there's all these card, you know, these decks and these decks are created by individuals and, and they project whatever they are onto these onto these mm -hmm. cards and so you're on one hand you're you're putting what you what's coming from your own psyche but on the other mm -hmm. hand you're having a conversation with with the person mm -hmm. who, who who created those cards mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. and with whatever whatever forces they may have been attuned to because yeah. you know our minds are not you know isolated by this wall of bone around them our minds interpenetrate with the world and so you know, when Pamela Col Coleman Smith sat down and you know painted another another tarot card she was tapping into things and so what was moving through her, you're having a conversation with those, always. Um, and yeah, it's complicated. This is why one of, the, one of the basic rules for becoming good at the Turo is, you know, you, you cast a reading, write it down. Go back over it a few days later or the next day or whatever time will be appropriate for you. And say, okay, how did this match up to what actually happened? If you do that regularly, if you cast, say, one reading a day and say, you know, how's this day going to go? And then you look over the, the events the next day and say, wow, I missed this and this and this and this. You, pretty soon you'll figure out what the cards are trying to say to you. And then you become a very good diviner. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess it's, it's, it's reading the cards in relationship to the other cards. Like as if, so it's like a symbol. It's like a language, uh, you know, like any other language, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a visual oh, yeah. language. So you're reading exactly. sentences. You're reading sentences when you're reading mm -hmm. the, the the images. Um, it's just that yeah. we're sort of symbolically literate, illiterate in our mm -hmm. culture. Uh, in a sense, oh, yeah. we don't, oh. I think we don't really realize how, how symbols and and stuff and things like that are affecting. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to look at look at visual languages mm -hmm. very very well. Mm -hmm. Well, many of us don't know how to use how to use spoken language very well, and you know the, we we can grumble about the education system all we want to. the The pattern of reading, the spread, if you will, gives you the grammar of the sentence. The um, the cards give you the words. If you keep those two things in mind, okay, this this position means X. This card means X. Okay. That's what it means. These relate to one another in these ways. Again, you know, this word modifies that word. This adjective modifies that noun. It, it takes practice, but so does language. We all started going ma and went on from there. And in the same way, we, we um, you know, when dealing with the tarot and dealing with any system of divination, you've got to start with the baby steps, with the sort of bad, bad, bad moment, and then go on and actually start assembling the sentences and, and making sense of them. So you're saying kind of, I think that you need to have a good precise meaning of what the symbols, you well, know, you, in, in a also, sense, and then, then you have some freedom of interpretation. Like if you have a good, mm -hmm. if you're, if you, if you keep, if you have a coherent sort of structure going into it. Yeah. Well, you yeah. start, you start with a good, with a clear idea of what the cards mean, and then you adjust that based on your experience. Mm -hmm. If every time you turn up the five of swords, you find that you get into a quarrel at work. You need to start including that sense in that five of swords and say, oh, that's part of what that means. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes this evolutionary process where bit by bit you adjust your understanding. You know, in the same way, you know, we all, um, you know, when we were, when we were you know, one years old, every four-legged animal was goggy. Okay, and then gradually we started narrowing down what what goggy became doggy became dog, and we got to the point that we understood the difference between Fido over here and, and the various other dogs and so on. That's the same process in learning tarot. You start with the five of swords, or, or you know what have you, the four of pentacles, and you have a sort of general, vague idea of what that means. You refine it down through experience, through conversations that include the tarot, you. And the experiences that Charles was predicting. Hmm. How so does what this... about? Oh, go on, Andrew. You go. <laughs> no, 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 you go. And I'm asking more questions. It's your your turn. Well, no, I mean, I was just uh, thinking about the conversation you guys were having about mandalas right when we started. Mm -hmm. 
well. And it mm -hmm. seems like there's a natural kind of synergy between what you're talking about, learning the grammar mm -hmm. and the language of mm -hmm. reading cards and mm -hmm. the way things go together in a mandala. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Very much so. I, I mentioned Manly P. Hall a little while ago, the great American occultist. Um, he actually arranged to get initiated into Shingon Buddhism, the same branch of esoteric Buddhism my family is involved in. And in fact, he refers to it in some of his writings on the tarot. He, he um, discusses that, you know, Shingon uses two mandalas. They've got um, the Kongokai or um, Vajra realm and the Taizokai or womb realm, uterus realm. Uh, mandalas, and so the he, assigned, he he equated the greater arcana, the trumps, with the Vajra realm mandala, and he equated the smaller card, the rest of the deck, with the womb realm mandala. So yes, we're talking about very much the same kind of thing here. Yeah, I mean, and there's elemental realities, right? Because mm -hmm. because in in a mandala you have colors which are are related to mm -hmm. um, different you know, anything from personality types to the elements to, mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. moods to, to, um, you know, mm -hmm. all of which are related to each other. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. I guess actually, that's actually, why I, I suddenly become, yeah. became fascinated in tarot having mm -hmm. zero interest before, because, mm -hmm. because when you're working with the symbolic system, you, you, you start to get a feel for, for just elemental realities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You start to see a little bit behind as you say, behind the concretion, and mm -hmm. you would think you could think that the mandala would be a claustrophobic, you know, uh, you know, world. But actually, the limitation, uh, placing those sim symbolic limits on things, opens up energy mm -hmm. fields. Uh, um, oh, there's yeah. like a paradox there, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. No, the the thing is, the mandala is is as big as as all space. It can as as indeed is the tarot. You can include the entire cosmos in those 78 little cards. You can include the entire cosmos in, in any mandala. So, yeah, it's, um, it's, all, it's the, same, the same is true of the, of the tree of life. You've got 10 circles, you've got 22 paths. Restrictive, right? <laughs> Not hardly. It's, it's the whole universe. It's like because a musical it's, music keys, too, yeah. right? It's sort yeah. of like there's a certain, in the Western scale, it's a very limited amount of notes, but mm -hmm. there's infinite variation. Right. Yeah, yeah, and then you know you can play them in an infinite number of ways. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, I'm thinking, I'm thinking within in Indian music also. In any given raga, there's there's a fixed set of notes and a fixed number of variations you can play. You can ring, you know, changes you can ring on those notes. What you can do with within that that compass is pretty spectacular. So yeah. Right. Yeah. And then also the rastas, which in Indian culture, which are moods or states mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. mind, and 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 I find that very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you know, the we we have this. There's this weird notion in modern alternative spirituality that limits are bad. That that you know, limits are anything limited is horrible. We should break through the limits. We should expand. We should free ourselves from limits. I often wonder what would happen if people who are in the middle of saying that had the the chair which is limiting the the capacity of their rump to hit the floor to suddenly like go away. Limits <laughs> are necessary. Limit limits are a source of strength. Their limits are the bait. You cannot manifest anything without limits. You know, <laughs> you know, right? You rely on the the fact that your your skeleton limits your body's ability to collapse. That your skin limits the ability of your body fluids to just flow on out. We don't even talk have to talk about sphincters at this point. Limitation has enormous strength, and it's it's an essential part of bringing anything into being. And so, I think we need to get more used to that, more comfortable with limits, with choosing limits, rather than having them being chosen for us because we're not we're not willing to accept them. Okay. That makes me think of this idea of the will, you know, of intention mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. as, as, as it should. The will is strong when it, when it limits itself. The will is strong when you direct everything toward one goal and limit your interest in everything else. Just limit it completely. So you want this one thing, you focus on this one thing, your intention flows out like a laser beam in a single direction and it hits its target. If you just sort of flop out in all directions and you want this and you want that and you want the other thing, you're not going to achieve any of them. You know? 
one of those one of those uncomfortable realities that sort of flies in the face of of pop culture spirituality these days. Hmm. Yeah. Well, pop culture spirituality, that's a, maybe a good subject in a sense, because tarot is notorious for being flaky new age pop culture spirituality, even mentioning it to some people, you know, brand you as a, a sort of, you know, flaky person, it would seem. <laughs> so, so like, what's the difference? I mean, and what is like, maybe you could tell us a little bit about like your tradition and what's, what's a good tradition? What's, What's the difference okay. between pop, you know? Okay, okay. Pop culture and real esoteric. pop culture and, and serious esotericism. Yeah. yeah. Um, the thing is, in every in in every culture and every spiritual or non spiritual tradition, you have this same duality. Uh, you know, you've got people who are serious about programming computers, and then you've got people who just like playing around on them. You have. Um, serious surfers and you have the people who are just sort of lounging on the beach and every so often sort of um, tumbling off a surfboard. Um, and it's a lot easier to do the, to do the simpler version. It's a lot easier just to, to do the pop culture version. Every so often you get a situation where, where pop culture goes crazy about some particular theme, whether it's, um, you know, as, whatever it is. In starting in the 70s and going up until well, right around 2012, it was magic and everything related to them. It was tarot, it was divination, it was um, Wicca. It, all these things became um, a much bigger deal in popular culture than they had been before for a very, very long time. And the result was that, you know, because a lot of the people who who sort of drift from one pop culture thing or another, we, we can we can call them flakes. It's, you know, without too much inaccuracy. They're people flakes. who that what what they like doing is sort of drifting along and enjoying whatever pop culture has to offer, which is fine. It's oh, just okay. that it tends to confuse things a lot. Because at the same time you have other people who are treating as magic. As um, with, with the same kind of focus that somebody gets into becoming a classical musician or a martial artist. Those two comparisons are actually very close. If you want to practice um, ceremonial magic, if you want to get out of the Golden Dawn tradition or any of the other tradi serious traditions, it's going to take you the kind of daily practice that you have to do if you're going to learn to play the piano, if you're going to learn to play the violin or any other, any other reasonably demanding instrument. Your instrument is your own mind, and, and, but you know, that's a very fussy instrument right there. It takes a lot of learning how to play. And you can make some really horrible noises on it until you learn how. You have to actually function with it. So, so you have this, this real tendency during this, this period of, of pop cultural occultism of enormous numbers of people who were um, buying tarot decks and um, you know, doing tarot readings for their friends now and then and buying books on magic and dressing up every so often in, in, in robes that made them look spooky or, or you know, witchy or what have you. And every so often getting together with some people to do a little ritual or what have you. And, and it's all fine. It's all very, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that pop culture does. That's the kind of thing that, that the mass mind does and that people who are attuned to that do. And there's nothing wrong with it. But then you also have people who, again, who are taking it much more seriously and things tended to get confused. You get people who are insisting, you know, my, this pop culture stuff is the be all and end all and really make, embarrassing the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, as for which, my, 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 own, my own journey was kind of a strange one. Um, I originally started, I originally got interested in Western esoteric spirituality in, in the mid-1970s. There was not much available at that time. Um, I, had to, I had to get by on what, the handful of books I could get from the public library and from, from such bookstores as I could reach in suburban Seattle, Washington. And um, gradually, you know, amass a library, learn how to do certain practices. I was working entirely on my own for quite a number of years there. And then I ended up meeting some people and, and finally finding some teachers and so on. And was involved in that, got involved by way of a, of a connection um, with a friend in, in the Druid scene. And that spun into weird places that I was not expecting. I, I, it, I, I promise you it was never one of my life goals to become the, the head of an American Druid order. 
and you know, spent twelve spent twelve years as Grand Archdruid of the Ancient Order of Druids in America. It was great publicity, but you know that is three fifty. You'll get you a cup of coffee, and <laughs> um, you know, and so it was just. I I have done a number of different training programs in a number of different systems, um, Hermetic um, and Druid, and of course, you know, some of the some some various things, various other orders, and so on, as as one does in this and in, in the old fashioned sort of occult circles that I run in. And as for which ones are good, well, the one that's good is the one that works for you. Mm-hmm. It's as with a tarot deck, there is no there ain't no such thing as one true way. There ain't no such thing as the one way that everyone has to go. That delusion, that ego delusion, is the cause of a lot of unnecessary confusion out there. There are many different paths. They lead by many different routes, and they may not all lead to the same place. But you know, I'm far from sure that we're all supposed to go to the same place, that, that it's all a matter of you know, marching in lockstep up to some particular um, you know, destiny of the soul. Um, my what what I encourage people to do who are interested in such things is to do some serious reading, um, get an idea of what's out there, talk to people, you know, do the do, do the website stuff, um, and get a sense of what the different options are, and then then dabble a little bit. Try a little of this, try a little bit of that, find the one that seems to work for you, and then you can actually start looking for a school. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering, like, why some people would be inclined esoterically, you know, because I noticed there's people who are just like into Zen, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and Zen is a very simple path. Mm-hmm. It's hard as hell and it's challenging and it's deep. But, oh, yeah. But yeah. It, it's, 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 it has a simple structure, let's mm-hmm. say, whereas the esoteric mm-hmm. paths are, are are so Baroque and elaborate and, and, and bizarre. Mm-hmm. So so, mm-hmm. so I, I'm, I'm wondering what type of person goes into these elaborate things and what type of person would do something that's, else that's an exceedingly interesting question and i hope somebody does a survey on it someday yeah. i do know that some people are very definitely drawn toward the you know, all the bells and whistles and the mandalas and the tarot decks and the you know the complicated rituals and all that kind of stuff and some people would much rather um go to a zendo or a quaker meeting or what have you and just have it be stark and simple and keep the complexity at bay. And they both seem to get good places. And I don't think they do equally well if they went to each other's um, went to each other's ways. So apparently we're talking about some kind of basic dis- difference in human beings. Yeah. I, like the, I like the fussy stuff. I like doing ritual. I enjoy ritual a great deal. Um, it is an art form. Um, I enjoy the study. I enjoy um, the learning and the reading and, and the various other practices and so on. Um, if Zen was what I had access to, I'd probably be doing it. But um, fortunately, there are there are more fussy, more complicated options. So, the, what is the purpose? Like, 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 what? So, your path is? Can you define your path a little bit? Or? I hope I I hope or, I will be able to do that. Is that too easy? Is that too? Would that be too simplistic a, a thing to no, add? No, it's 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 too. It, the, the thing is, I mean, it's no. It's very common in the early stages of of everybody's esoteric journey that they they'll have a simple term. They'll say, "Well, I am a hermeticist. I am a druid. I am I am I'm practicing Zen. I'm practicing Vajrayana. You know, I'm practicing yoga or what have you." And then it starts getting complicated. <laughs> hmm. And then they try some of this and they add some of that and they end up going off in this direction. And it becomes very hard to um, to put any kind of label. And the further you go, the harder it becomes to label it. I really don't know what, how I would describe my path. It is definitely within the Western esoteric tradition. Um but it has in, it includes it's included um, substantial elements of druidry, of hermeticism, of Gnostic, certain um, varieties of Gnosticism, etc., etc., etc. Ultimately, I think it just comes down to my path, and I think that's a lot of a lot of what happens with, with so many people who get on this get on this sort of work, is that their path ends up being become being totally unique to them, and I think that's as it should be. 
So it's not an assembly line process. <laughs> no, no, you yeah. can't. The, the the traditions that treat it as an assembly line, to my mind, falsify the basic the basic nature of spirituality. In the golden non tradition, um, just as as kind of a hint of where it's going, the highest grade of initiation, the grade that they, that they don't confer in a lodge, the one you have to attain yourself, is ipsissimus, which is a Latin word meaning most completely yourself. Mm, nice. <laughs> And so that's the goal of the Golden Dawn work, to become most completely yourself, to become, uh, to fulfill all of your own individual potential, which is unlike that of any other soul anywhere in the cosmos. So, you know, it gets, it gets weird as you go. What is the meaning for, of initiation? I'm sorry? What is the meaning of initiation? Initiation? Well, the word, the word basically means beginning. Okay. And so initi- initiation, there has been probably more cause follow-up ladled over that one concept than anything else except the lost continent of Atlantis. Okay. Um, or maybe the origins of the Turo, but certainly the lost continent of Atlantis. Initiation is a way of getting a running start at a given tradition. Um, in the Golden Dawn tradition, for example, there's a series of initiation rituals, and you go through these rituals. They are they are basically theatrical performances with an audience of one. The person who goes through them is the audience, and they are intended to sort of jolt that person awake in certain ways, using the tools of dramatic performance, using some of the tools of of magical working of esoteric practice, to sort of pop them into a state of, of Increased awakeness. Now, they finish the so your 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 candidate goes through the neophyte grade initiation, which is really lovely, really colorful, and has and and a lot of fun to perform to put on. And then they go, you know, they they finish and go home. That's when the real work begins, because all initiation is is a beginning. If you had this ceremony, now is when you need to start doing the work. The ceremony will help you get a good start. It'll give you, it's like a push on the swing, but you're the one who has to start um, working to keep that swing moving higher and higher. So that's all initiation is. Again, it's been covered with a lot of cod swell. If you get vast numbers of, um, especially books from an older generation that talking about becoming an initiate, always with a capital I, and all kinds of lurid stories of you know, the, the you know the, the great initiator you know taking me in trance into the mountains of Tibet or what have you. <clears throat> um, it makes for great you know it's great publicity. But initiation is simply a way of beginning. Self initiation is always an option. And I know that that statement will get screams of outrage from certain circles, but they're gonna have to deal with it. Um, Self initiation is an option. It's the hard it's it's it takes more work. It That's an interesting way question, to... right? That's very interesting. Yeah. Like, do you need a master? Like, and and that, and, uh, and no. can you do it on your on your own on your own? You you can do it on your own. Um, it is useful to have a teacher. It is useful to have a tradition to guide you. It is useful to have other resources that can help you keep from running off the rails in certain ways. But I mean, even in, in esoteric Buddhism, there's the tradition of the Pratyeka Buddha, the 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 self initiated, the self enlightened Buddha, and you have that the same sense in the Western tradition much more broadly. The thing is, Western esoteric spirituality for so many centuries was a death penalty offense. If you were caught doing it, you'd be invited to one of those charming barbecues that the Inquisition holds, you know? <laughs> and it was awkward. Yeah. And so you had to keep <laughs> things very quiet. So the Western esoteric spirituality was refined down to the point that you could communicate it with very little contact with any other practitioner. And so oh, you might meet someone and be slipped a book. And that was what you had to go on. Or you might meet with somebody once a month and they would hand you a packet of papers and talk to you a little bit. And that was your contact. You might even not know that person's name. And mm. so the West, Western, Western occultists had to work out ways to communicate this stuff that you could basically do on your own. And so that's that's kind of made that a very a very wide open approach, especially in times where there are, where you know as sometimes happens. I'm sorry to say, when 
a lot of the established schools are kind of in bad shape and there's a lot of personality games and a lot of people who are angling for suckers wanting wanting to, to milk money out of them where there are um, you know, schools announcing, we will initiate you to all this stuff, just hand over the cash, and so on. Yeah. Um, you're much better off on your own in such a period. And so you know, that's, that's, that's always an option. Because, I mean, we are always, always in relationship to the divine, which is the source of, of all mastership, if you want to call it that. I mean, there, there is always that divine presence. There is always that divine spirit that guides us, that can guide us if we're open to being guided. So, I, yeah, I have one question about initiation because I, I told you that I practiced in a Vajrayana tradition. And mm -hmm. back in the 90s when I began that, I did a whole training program. You know, uh, this, you, know you do you do you do pre preliminaries. Uh, which and study and meditation and and mm -hmm. you know a lot of stuff and then you get to do the preliminaries which is like a big deal that you do you, that you I would you would do after a three month seminary and month long meditations and blah 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 mm -hmm. um, to get this great initiation and, and uh, secret practices and and then I walked into a, a center in Paris and there were there was some guy giving them out for you know beginners mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so I'm like, it's it's hilarious that for me, like that, uh, I'm wondering about the situation now because when that back in the '90s, those things they were still secret. Now they're now you can find whatever on the internet, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. at least in, in informational form. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but so 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 what's going on now it seems like it's the worst and the, be the best and the worst time for this because on the one hand everything mm -hmm. is available and open and nobody's going to take you to the barbecue or burn you with a steak <laughs> right inquisition it's barbecue all, is a great band it's all, it's all like it's oh all the, like, that would be a nobody lovely cares band. enough nobody cares enough to, to uh mm -hmm. to burn you at the stake um mm -hmm. so this seems like a period of great opportunity and yet also a period of corruption at the same time I'm, oh yeah what, what, what do you do you think i'm onto something no, I, th I, say? no I, th I think you're absolutely right and that's normal <laughs> basically mm. esoteric traditions alternate between periods of danger and trouble and relative purity and pe periods of ease and comfort and relative corruption because uh -huh. you know as one of my teachers used to put it humans gonna human we are human beings we have certain um incorrigible vices that tend to pop up among us quite readily. And so anytime that, you know, anytime that there isn't persecution breathing down your neck and keeping you honest, people are going to get greedy or they're going to do various other, you know, various other unproductive things. All we can do is, you know, this is the hand we've been dealt. This is the world in which we live. Each of us has the challenge of, of dealing with that and saying, okay, I can get access to these practices. I can get access to these teachings. Am I going to do anything about it? Well, that depends on you. Now, doesn't that, Junior? <laughs> and so yeah. it depends on what you want to do. My experience is that you, know, you, can, you can pick these things up, and if you're willing to work with them, if you're willing to pursue them in the same kind of disciplined fashion that a, you know, that a classical musician applies to their instrument and to their music, um, you, can get an, you can accomplish anything you want to. You can transform your life. You can you can have amazing experiences and and you know, become something you can't you probably can't even imagine at this point. It, it's not it, I won't say it's not that hard because it, it does take a lot of hard work. But there's the only barrier standing in the way is whether you're willing to put in the work. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, but I was thinking about you've written seventy books or something like that. Actually, it's it's past that now. I like to write. <laughs> so I can't imagine that kind of dedication and to, to writing. Oh, not, this is, I write it's too. But it's it's, it's not it's dedication. I don't own a television. Uh huh. Right. I don't own a tel. I've not owned a television in my adult life. I find it incredibly dull. Um, I'm not especially a social butterfly. My idea of you know a pleasant evening is to typically involves sitting at home with a cup of tea and a book, and so um, I like to write. I enjoy writing, and I write fairly quickly. So, um, I mean, seventy, eighty books is not actually that much. I think Asimov had more than three hundred. 
<laughs> Come on. <laughs> he did. Okay. So um, I, I forget how, um, who was. Oh, you know, I'm trying to think of another. There was a writer. The, I'm not getting his name. The guy who invented the shadow, the great uh, pulp detective figure, Walter Gibson. That's the name. Um, he used to turn out a full length novel every month. I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I take me at least six months to get one done. And so, yeah. I'm still working on my first novel. It's been 40 years now. Oh, oh no, no, <laughs> I no. It started no, no, when no. I was 12. <laughs> okay, good. Um, now finish it. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, seriously. If you sit down and write a thousand words a day, which is not that hard. Most people can do that in well under an hour. If you sit down and write a thousand words a day, um, in 35, in 70 days, okay, what's that, about two, two, two and a half months, you have a 70,000 word novel. Then you have to go back and edit it, of course, and that's going to take you another couple of months. But it isn't that hard. People make it much harder than it, than, than they, than it has to be. Um, then there, there are tricks around that. There are ways to do it, but mostly getting yourself out of the way and just letting yourself write. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you could like this. I'm gonna ask you like a like a, a sort of an obvious question, but I think we have kind of a general audience here, and so it'd be great mm -hmm. to to get your definition of of magic. What is magic? Okay, um, I, I the, the definition of magic that I use is the one that Dion Fortune, um, <clears throat> A.K.A. Uh, Violet Firth Evans. Um, oh, yeah, I like her. Yeah, the, 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 Dan Fortune um, coined this one back, I think, in the 1920s. It showed up in one of her essays. Um, magic is the, the art and science of causing change in consciousness in accordance with will. Now, when you say that to most people, they immediately misunderstand it. Because notice that doesn't say whose consciousness. And notice that it also doesn't say whose will. Right. You are dealing with everything from simple psychology to the heights of mystical attainment in that simple definition. The art and science of causing change in consciousness in accordance with will. Mm -hmm. So will could be an egoic form of and, and yes. small-minded yes, form and of will and just yes, and domination that, and kind of like will to power in the negative sense. And and you get and you get some people who pursue magic that way, and you and it needs to be understood that that's possible. It's a bad idea; it will blow up in your face quite reliably. But you need to know that's an option, so that if nothing else, you can be prepared to counter it, and then you can scale it up from there. What is your will? What is your actual will? What is the you know to borrow a, the notion from Schopenhauer? What is the what is the will to live? What is the will to be that is at the core of your being? What is your direction and your destiny? What is, what is the divine will for you that expresses itself through you? All of these are ways that you can take that concept of will and unfold it step by step. Hmm. Yeah, the divine will for you, which is kind of like... Um, uh, sort of the divine is usually considered to be something trans beyond the person, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We can, yeah, we can look at the we can look at the divine as a transpersonal. As, as I'll, I'll borrow again from from the sort from Schopenhauer that there is this there is a will that is that is the the thing the thing the the thing that is beyond that is within and within everything. Mm, right. Uh, right. That the divine is a will that unfolds itself in the creation of the universe, and that all that we see are manifestations of the divine will, and all that we are is a manifestation of the divine will. So here is this will that is flowing outwards through you, bringing you into being. What is it moving toward? What is it trying to attain? What are you trying to obtain? Mm -hmm. You know, you, if you look back, that's on sort of your the question life, one has to ask oneself all the time, right? You know, yeah, exactly. Continually, yeah, continually, continually as a zen, ask oneself that, right? Treat it as a Zen koan. You know, mm -hmm. what is the divine will for me? What mm -hmm. does the divine will through me? You can meditate on that one many, many hours. This reminds me a bit of the question that came up in the chat a few moments ago from Henrik, who said, um, "Hello, Henrik." 
Uh, yeah, Henrik, do you want to ask your question? Are you there? Uh, okay, he's not unmuted, so I'm going to read this question. It's, once okay, on your sure. unique path and find yourself in the dark, how do you find the next suitable next step? Okay, I, I missed part of that. Once you, before the dark, once you... But once you're on your unique path, so it was a few minutes ago when oh. we were talking about your path. Oh, gotcha, yeah. In this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And you find yourself in the dark. How do you find the next suitable step? If you are, if you have found your personal path, you won't be in the dark. You'll know which way you're going. Um, if you find yourself in the dark, you may have strayed from your path. The point is that the, the, the path you follow is always, um, it's a conversation, it's not just you deciding which way to go. It's you know if you're walking if you're walking through dense woodland, um, yes, your path to some extent depends on your choices, but it also depends on you know where is there an opening and where is there this wall of you know, this wall of thicket that gets in your way. So it's always a conversation. And if you feel like you're in the dark, if you feel that you're lost, stop and let listen to what the world is trying to tell you. It may be telling you you've gone down a blind alley. It may be telling you that um, you need to back up a little bit and go somewhere else. Or it may be telling you that the direction you need is right in front of your face and you just don't want to look at it. Um, but in my experience, certainly, there's always, you know, it's, it's, it's not a matter of being lost. Being lost is what happens when you're trying to follow someone else's guidance. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. What if you're in, in a state of, let's say, chaos or Govora, we talked mm -hmm. about the five of swords. Mm -hmm. in, in that case, in, you know, if you're in the middle of a five of swords situation and everything, you know, things are falling to bits around you, obviously, um, you're going to be dealing with that. And it may be that that's your path for the moment. Maybe just sort of navigating your way through chaos is, is what you need to do. Um, I know a number of people, a number of occultists that I know, um, were caught kind of unawares when the, um, when the COVID shutdowns began. And a lot of us ended up putting that time to very good use because, you know, there was mm -hmm. less to do and lots of things shut down. Okay, let's do some intensive personal work. And it, it accomplished a lot for some people. So, you know, again, this is part of the conversation with the world. That chaos that's coming your way, that confusion and difficulty, those are... Those are messages. Those are communications from the world. Listen to them. See which way they're guiding you. Another question, maybe about dualism, like and, and Gnostic mm -hmm. dualism. You know, because usually that, that the, the, usually that often the critique of kind of let's say Gnosticism is that it splits the world into two. Like there's the spirit here, and then there's the real world, mm -hmm. world, world there. Um. How would you respond to that? Okay. We are very unfortunate in that the, the one big trove of Gnostic documents we have from, the, from Nagamadi um, came from a, a Gnostic tradition or a, a group of Gnostics on one end of the Gnostic movement, a group that was very deeply into that kind of dualism, that kind of, you know, the world is a black iron prison and we must escape from it to return to, the, to our homes in the world of light beyond. That's what they were into. Some people are into that. Um, it seems rather silly to me, but that's, you know, that's, that's their path. It's not mine to choose. Um, Gnosticism extends from there to some very different, more unitary or more complex approaches. The thing that makes Gnosticism Gnostic as opposed to anything else is the focus on Gnosis. The focus, and the Gnosis has been mistranslated a lot. Bentley Layton, who's done a very nice collection of Gnostic scriptures, like, like to translate it, acquaintance. Gnosis is personal acquaintance. It's the kind of knowledge you have of someone if, you, if you're well acquainted with them. Um, okay, here's a, here's a metaphor. Um, let's say that you just had a passionate year-long affair with somebody who was in a witness protection program. Okay? <laughs> every, every supposed fact you learned about that person, about where they're from, what they do for a living, etc., is actually false. But you still know that person after that year-long passionate affair extremely well. The knowledge you have of that person is the kind of knowledge that Gnostics seek to have of the divine. They want to have that kind of personal acquaintance. That's what makes Gnosis Gnosis, that it, assuming Gnosis is Gnostic. It's focused on personal acquaintance, not believing in ideology. And so 
some traditions of Gnosticism in the ancient world, yeah, had a very dualistic focus. Some of them didn't. They sort of sprawled all over the place. And as so often happens with traditions that are, that are focused on personal experience, they didn't get all dogmatic about it. It wasn't a matter of you're not sufficiently dualist. You will be you gnawed by scorpions in the abyss of slack or what have you. It was just, oh, that's interesting. That's not the way I do things. <laughs> you get yeah. a lot of that in the occult scene these days. So I, I consider that a good sign. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I was, I think you, you know, Greg um, um, Kaminsky, he was telling me that a lot of how we define Gnosticism comes from the Catholic Church and the, and the Gnostics, oh, yeah. and how they defined it as, as being a heresy, <laughs> obviously. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it is unfortunate that because of ideological commitments on the part of most of the sort of um, mainstream Christian churches, they're unable to deal with Gnosticism as anything but those bad guys who have bad ideas. And then they make up nasty stories about them. It's, it's embarrassing. I get the impression that thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor got left out of a lot of Bibles. <laughs> and mm -hmm. unfortunately, Gnostics, like occultists, like people who belong to other religions, have suffered the short end of that for a long time. Um, but yeah, Greg's right. Um, you know, that's on the one hand, you have a sort of, you have the sort of Catholic and also Orthodox Eastern Orthodoxy has its own, um, irritable comments about the Gnostics. And, um, then you also have nowadays the academic scene, which is busy trying to recruit the Gnostics for various, um, current ideological stances. Um, Elaine Pagel's work has been very popular and it's played an important role in letting people know about some of the, some of the possibilities of Gnosticism, but it too, to my taste, it is much too focused on trying to drag Gnosticism into various current cultural war categories and things like that, which is, you know, whatever. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you have some political writings uh, as well, right? <laughs> I, I have. Well, I, I was have hoping we very, I have a very, yeah. a very modest number of political writings, yes. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> no, I mean, I maybe I, I, again. Um, what is so? So you 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 were being crit critical of of, of ideology. Uh -huh. So, mm -hmm. what is your what is your view or or perspective of the political landscape at the moment? And and then okay. how does your cultic work? How does your cultic work inform that? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I like to irritate everybody by calling myself a moderate Burkean conservative. Let me unpack that for a moment. Edmund Burke, as I think some people still remember, was a British politician of the, of the, the era leading up to the Napoleonic Wars. Um, he was also an author. He wrote um, several very influential books, um, a study of, the, of the, an aesthetic book on the, on the experience of the sublime, a set of reflections on the revolution in France that became one of the guiding points of sort of moderate conservatism thereafter. His basic idea was that um, human societies are organic growths. If you try to um, tear things down and impose some kind of abstract, ideological, perfect society, you're going to make a steaming mess of things, as we've seen. If you want to reform, if you want to tinker, if you want to improve, that's quite another matter. He was very much in favor of that. Um, like, like many people um, on his end of the political spectrum, he supported the American Revolution, for example, even though it was overthrowing his king, getting, chasing his king out of North America or out of the southern half of North America. Um, so Burke started this, this whole notion of conservatism not as, a, not as a rigid worship of the past, but as a, okay, yes, the current, situ the current system has its problems, but at least it more or less functions. Are you sure your system will do any better, or will it possibly be worse? So um, that's been my stance for a long time. Yes, there are a lot of things about um, current, you know, current um, social, cultural, and political um, systems that badly need help. Tearing them down or replacing with, excuse my phrase, someone's brain fart is not necessarily going to be an improvement. 
We saw what happened in the French Revolution. We saw what happened in the Russian Revolution. We saw what happened in Germany in 1933. All of those were led by charismatic figures who said, we can fix everything. We can tear it down to the, to the ground and build this wonderful new society. And Pol Pot in Cambodia had the same promise. You saw how well that worked. Um, Whereas most of the real improvements in human life, most of the real improvements in human rights have happened in a step-by-step fashion, have happened by people looking at the situation and say, okay, let's make this change and see how it works. Um, I like to offend people on on the conservative side of things by pointing to same-sex marriage as a great example. Um, That did not require tearing down the world. It required a modest change in the marriage laws. I think it was a great idea. It was done in an intelligent way. People, um, you know, people built a case for it. They built a constituency for it. They passed laws or, or you know, or pursued uh, legal action. They got the thing in place. And what happened? A bunch of people got married. End of story. <laughs> and that's a mode of reform that we can pursue much more broadly, you know, with, with good effect, with good results. Instead of saying everything's dreadful and we have to tear it to shreds or let's just – or worse yet, let's just march around and yell at people and, and hope that that will make the world better. Yeah, that well, makes imminent that sense. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can say now that I was I've offended all our speaking, listeners – Excuse me to interrupt interrupting. <laughs> yeah, now that I've offended all of our listeners, um, as for how occultism informs that – one of the the idea that human societies are not artifacts they are not things that people may make in manufacture they're not things that they put together consciously they grow a human society is an organism okay now maybe you think you should um you decide stomachs are unnecessary okay i want to get rid of my stomach oh and i think i only need one lung and i should have four arms you know, pretty soon you're going to rack up a pretty good surgeon bill and your chance of survival is going to start dropping very rapidly evolution is smarter than you are biology is smarter than you are the universe is smarter than you are maybe you should listen to what the world is saying to you maybe you should draw on the experiences of the past and say okay then all of these are occult concepts. All of these are based on the idea that the universe is a place of meaning. It is not a random collection of lumps of dead matter bobbing around in the void. It is the material expression of spiritual process. And if you're not satisfied with the way the world is, well, there are things you can do about it. There are things you can do. I spoke about political reform. You can also look at changing the energies that you yourself are putting out, both individually and collectively into the world, and changing those energies so they don't come around and bite you in the backside, as they so often do. Yeah, so this is like working on the meta is is equally as important as going out and and changing just changing shit Mm -hmm. right i think exactly exactly yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. the thing is you can you can make as many reforms as possible what what, you know meet the new boss same as the old boss if you don't change the deeper structures you don't change anything that matters you can overthrow a government the new one's going to be just as bad um you can throw out one set of scoundrels and elect another set of scoundrels or what have you, unless you change the patterns. And the patterns are actually built into your own life. One of the things I, – I was, I was heavily involved back in the very first the, – the first decade or so of this century. I was very heavily involved in the peak oil movement, the movement of people who are trying to point out that, well, you know, there's a finite amount of petroleum in the world. We're burning it very quickly, and that means that down the road, the price is going to go up to, wow, you know, $60, $70 a barrel. That was a lot back then. Um, and – the number of people I knew in that scene who would talk um, about how much they loved the earth and about how upset they were about ecological devastation, and then they'd climb into their SUVs all by themselves and drive 300 miles back to go to work for some fossil fuel company. Yeah, or they'd go finish their talk, and then they'd fly to Bali for a vacation on you know these jetliner farting fossil fuels the whole way. And there's an enormous amount of hypocrisy in that. And one of the reasons that the peak oil movement fell over and died around 2010 is that the hypocrisy just became too much for people for people to to deal with any longer. They just kind of slunk away because. 
too many other people were saying, okay, if you think we should less, use less petroleum, how about you do it? We're seeing this with the climate change types nowadays, where you know you have all of these. You have Bill Gates, who owns four private planes, insisting that he, it doesn't matter that he's you know flying par- private planes, dumping CO2 in the atmosphere like there's no tomorrow, because he's one of the good guys. Oh, funny about that. You need to start with by changing your life. It's what the what the, what the choice of Apollo said to Rainier Maria Rilke: "Do must then live in You must change your life. You cannot." Um, make change unless you're willing to pioneer that change with your own behavior to lead by example. And if you're not willing to do that, it probably doesn't actually mean that much to you. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what I've thought of the maxim as so below it, as above, so below, or whatever, being yeah, like, okay, yeah. we work on the microcosm in order to, yeah. to affect the macrocosm. And, exactly. You know. Exactly. As above, so below, as within, so without, the universe is a universe. It is that which turns around a single pivot, as that word originally meant, the universus, that which turns as one. Um, And if you want to make change, let's see you change your own life first and see how it works. Yeah. I was thinking of how things are um, shaping up for 2024 in America, because I know that you're... (laughs) You know, your book on uh, the 2016 whole shebang with Donald Trump is is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Your theory Mm -hmm. that this is a Native American trickster god showing up to bite Mm -hmm. (laughs) the arrogant bourgeois Americans in the butt. But that energy sort of fizzled out of Trump by about 2020, and he just became Mm -hmm. another dickhead. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that, that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty good description, yeah. And but the 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 thing is, the trickster energy is still definitely flowing in this country. It's just it hasn't it hasn't instantiated itself in quite the same way. It's more that circumstances are tripping us up. You know, the 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 trickster is 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 deftly um, you know putting banana peels under the under the feet of various um, allegedly um, you know <laughs> dignified statesmen and causing them to land on their nose. And think, twenty twenty four is going to be interesting. Of course, um, Trump is is you know gearing up to run again, and Biden insists he's going to run again. We've got this geriatric cage match between two <laughs> men who probably should be in nursing homes instead. And generally, in the United States right now, one of the great problems we have is um, we have a senile kleptocracy welded in place. We have a kleptocracy of baby boomers who should – every other generation retired from public life when they had the 70s. Okay, The boomers – won't do it. They are clinging like grim death to the the facade of their own of their own vanished relevance. I think partly, you know, they were all they they all came the boomers. And I'm talking about my generation here. I, I'm I'm at the tail end of the boom, okay. And um, boomers came barreling in, convinced they were going to save the world, they were going to transform the world. It was the age of Aquarius, the greening of America, all this schlock. And then they did what generations typically do and cashed out their ideals and went for power instead. Um, they did a little more crassly than some, but you know, it's, it's, it's the normal pattern. But they never ditched the rhetoric. And so you have these multimillionaire senators and politicians who have, been, who have had their face in the pig trough of you know, corporate America for decades now. Who, who, you know, th- their last acquaintance with their former ideals was when they got something out of a closet 30 years ago. And yet they're still stuck in this mindset where they're the ones who are going to save the world. They're the ones, they're, they're, they're the young, they're the ones who, who, who have the dream and to actually face what they become would kill them. And so they're clinging to, they're clinging to that fantasy. They're clinging to that thought that only they can can save things. And so I think, you know, over the next decade or so, as they finally sunset out, we're going to see a lot of um, very jagged emo- collective emotions. We're going to see a lot of people finally going, oh, thank God they're out of the way. Now we can get, we can sweep aside all the wreckage and get to work rebuilding a nation again. Mm, and at the same time, we've also got the 
the war and the question mark over in Eastern Europe and Western Europe. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's, you know, that's kind of on my mind because I remember the last time we spoke, which was mid-2021, I think, and you said mm-hmm. there's something interesting spiritual going on in West Russia at the moment. And then six mm-hmm. months later, this fucking huge war mm. blows up. and fucking mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, there's, there's, there are interesting spiritual things going on. There are interesting political things going on. Um, this is a war. This is a zero-sum war because NATO and the United States have staked their credibility on it. And yet it's an existential struggle for Russia. The, you know, the folks from uh, various U.S. military think tanks have all been publishing their plans on how they're going to break Russia up into a bunch of little weak countries that can be absorbed by NATO. You know, the Russians are looking at that going, we know this movie. (laughs) And (laughs) so, yeah, they overreacted. And so, (laughs) you know, so things are going boom in a big way. Um, (laughs) You know, hypersonic missiles, which they haven't, um, we don't yet, are busy blowing things up over there. And (laughs) how is it going to end? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a time machine. Um, So far, the Russians are playing it very cool and very cagey. And exactly what they're going to do with all these additional troops that they that, that they've mustered in the last in the last year or so, I, I don't happen to know. But I think in the future people are going to see this war and its immediate aftermath as a major turning point. It's already become one. I mean, we saw how China um, just moseyed into the Middle East and made the Saudis and the Iranians cut a deal and stop their hostilities. The United States used to do that kind of thing 20 years ago. We don't do that anymore. China's doing it now. We have Iran. There are naval exercises scheduled for the Gulf of Oman later this month. And the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian navies will be doing cooperative naval naval drills. (laughs) The world is changing around us. And I'm not sure that a lot of people in, in the NATO countries in the United States and in Europe have any clue what's actually happening. Not certainly not if they, if they all they pay attention to is corporate media. Mm, and what about the spiritual side of things? Um, the spiritually speaking, one of the core things we're seeing here is the twilight of what Oswald Spengler called Faustian civilization, the civilization that had its birth in Western Europe around the year, around the year 1000. Um, it has finished its course, and part of that process is that the particular cognitive mode, the particular spiritual mode that it projected over much of the world is breaking up. It's, it's, fin- it's finished its work. It has brought peoples into contact who never would have come into contact before, but now it's all sort of collapsing in on itself. Meanwhile, we have something rising in Russia, something that clairvoyants and mystics have been seeing for um, getting up for 200 years now. Um, The idea that one of the next great civilizations will emerge in what is now Russia, probably along the Volga Valley, uh, sometime around 2100. And so that's that's sort of in the process of stirring right now. Will there are there are there other civilizations that that will rise? Yes, of course, um, those happen, and we're moving through just these, this very awkward transitional time, as certain visions of destiny, certain visions of human purpose and possibility are collapsing. I mean, I think I, I, it will it will very it will interest me during the rest of this life, in fact, to watch what happens to the old dream of space travel. It's a failed dream. One of the things nobody wants to talk about is that, you know, outer space is full of hard radiation. You can't have a space-faring civilization anywhere in the solar system this side of about Saturn if the radiation levels are too high. <laughs> you know, and this is something they've known since the 1970s. Nobody wants to talk about it. That's why we don't have, you know, uh, spaceships going to Mars, but it's such a part of the Faustian mentality that people are clinging to that, that Star Trek dream. Even though it's dead, even though so it's that's not a dream of expansionism, right? Yeah, it is. exactly. So, so is, the, is the idea now that we need to sort of go inward in a sense, or well, the the question is, can the Faustian spirit go inward, or will it simply implode? Hmm. Can it? You know, if space is the final frontier, and that turns out to be the frontier from which we fell back in failure and confusion, 
what happens to a civilization that has only been able to think in terms of infinite expansion in straight lines. The only civilization in history that's ever done linear perspective has only seen that, move, zooming off to infinity. Um, I don't know. That's the question. Can we reorient ourselves in the Faustian world, or is the Faustian world simply going to implode, as some civilizations do? Um, that's one of the big questions right now. I don't have an answer to it. Or are we end of a sort of Kali Yuga stage, right? And then, then the new state, the new world is kind mm -hmm. of like sparkling through. There'll be another kind of world. Or... Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think one way or another, um, the the sort of European worldview, the Faustian worldview, never really set deep roots here in the United States. And so oh, here in the here in the U.S., you see more of it right along the East Coast. Um, we were settled earlier, but you get over the Appalachians and the tone changes, and there's very much a sense. I've had a sense, and this is something that other other that mystics and clairvoyants have also been talking about. There's something going to be born, not not soon, maybe five six hundred years from now. But there's something there's something stirring in the Ohio River Valley, and it will be something different. It will not be a European style of civilization any more than any other civilization is. Each civilization is different. Each one expresses its own way of being human. And, but it's, it's a different world out there. And it's, it's very exciting, you know, as, as an American born and bred, just fee, being, being in that part of the world and sort of feeling it stirring through the soil and stone. Here, where, where I now live in Rhode Island, this is this is as European as you get in North America. Um, I, I learned not long ago that this the particular geolo chunk of geology that I'm that, that I live on, it's actually it was part of an old continent, and the other half of it consists of um, southern England, Wales, and uh, a little bit of northern Europe. It got it got torn apart uh, about the time the dinosaurs were running around, and, and so it's in those two pieces. But this is actually geologically part of, part of a, 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 an ancient continent that was the, the other half of which is now part of Europe. So it has that sort of European vibe. Um, but what's going to happen? That's, <laughs> you know, that's the thing that makes it exciting. You can do divination. You can do, you can cast, you know, tarot readings or use whatever other, other method you choose and get glimpses of things stirring. But the full story is not something that, that anyone will know until it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, maybe one of the myths about tarot is like predicting is not quite mm -hmm. right. It's more like sensing or, or, or yeah. um... every so often. Every so often you do a reading that's so clear and that sparks your intuition so powerfully that, pow, you see the whole thing. And there's this, this picture. But it's never the whole world. It's always this one particular glimpse of this one particular situation that you know how it's going to work out. And there are other times where all you get is just faint glimpses, and then sometimes you miss it completely. It's one of those things. You know, the the divinatory senses are no more accurate than eyesight, and we all know how you know, ten people watch a traffic accident. How many how many different sets of events do they report? Yeah, what I'm getting from you from all this is like just a vision of how the world is changing, and and also how sort of reified we are in our views of reality of what Europe is and what America is and of what. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. For for a people, for for a civilization that has put so much energy into studying history, many of us are just blind to the implications of history. We think that that history stops with us, and it's just going to be like this forever. I'm sure you, we've all read bad science fiction novels that assume that you know England is going to be England or America is going to be America or what have you. You know, umpty thousand years from now. Which is drivel. I mean, I mean, not a lot of people in southern England wear togas and go down to the Roman baths. It was very popular there two thousand years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Owen oh, still does though. <laughs> oh, I wish. <laughs> Owen, I've, I've seen Owen wearing togas, and yeah. 
Oh, I think I think you should definitely put on a put on a toga and go out. <laughs> Say, excuse me, in, in Latin, mind you. Excuse me, could you direct me toward the bath? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh no, I want to find some Dionysian mysteries. That's what I'm. Uh, I'm going to take that toga off out on the hills. That's more my vibe, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting talking to you. Like, I, I, the occult has again. I, I have. I'm sort of like the, the vision that people have of that is that it's some sort of un, very unreasonable thing. But but you're you're a very reasonable person. You you have you know you're a very clear thinking, reasonable person. And I'm always well, struck thank, by thank that. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. always struck by that by people who are very deep into this stuff, like how mm-hmm. how thoughtful they are and and. Uh, yeah, if if you read, we were talking about Dion Fortune earlier, or Man or Manly P. Hall. If you yeah. read their books, you're not dealing with dog, crazed dogmatic um, uh, maniacs who are saying, you know, that that um, stones fall straight up and that uh, the world is not merely flat; it's square and has has a nice gilt border around the edge. You know, it's very popular for the defenders of the current current modes of consciousness to portray occultists that way. Because they can say, well, no, we're the smart ones. We're the ones who are realistic. Well, they proceed with policies that are running uh, quite a number of countries face first into the ground. And where the cultists are saying, don't go there. <laughs> so, you know, it's one yeah, of the... There seems to be a conservatism to, to a lot of occultism compared to, oh, yeah. let's, say, let's say, the more radical, you know, other progressive bunch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, well... Uh, Occultists almost always are saying, "Well, how did that work the last time?" We, we, you know, we we do that with with our magical traditions. We're saying, "Okay, here's this thing that Dion Fortune used to do that worked pretty well. Here's this other thing she used to do that didn't work very well. Okay, let's do this and not that." Uh-huh. And so, yeah. if if you've got that that eye toward the past, you can apply that to history just as well. Here's this political scheme that worked really well. Here's this other one that failed. Let's do this one and not that one, and. Progr- the progressive types, that's, that's a term that always makes me kind of stop, progressive. Because it's always yeah. based on the assumption that history doesn't matter, that we can make all the old mistakes and have them all work. And somehow it doesn't, it, no matter how many disasters follow, it never sinks in. Yeah. But then, you know, the thing is, progress, faith in progress is the number one religion in the world today. And I don't mean that as a joke. I don't mean that as a metaphor. Yeah, people no, worship yeah, progress. Yeah. People put their faith in progress the way medieval peasants put their faith in, you know, the bones of St. Ethel for us. Um, progress will save us all. Progress will take us to the stars. And the fact that we've actually been in decline for half a century now, and that it's, it requires a massive effort not to notice that on a daily basis. You step outside, look at the condition of the sidewalk. <laughs> if you've been around for more than 18 years, you'll, you'll have noticed the change. And yet nobody can admit that to themselves, next to nobody. Most people, they no, we've got to be progressing. We've got to be on our way to the stars. The fact is we're on our way to a dark age. No Especially in America, because oh, yeah. America has this very, like I think Europeans are a little bit more world-weary than, than you guys. Yeah. Oh yeah, but but hey, I've I've heard a lot of people in England who are still, st- especially you know, toward the toward the more comfortable end of the social pyramid, the social pyramid, who are insistent. No, we are going forward. We are not going back. We not be. We may not be going to the stars, but we're going to go through all these various progressive things, which somehow always help the comfortable classes more than anyone else. Oh, that's right. And, I see it every day. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they've just they've redefined progress since you know England. England gave up on its own uh, its own interplanetary ambitions back in the 1950s, <laughs> and and you know about the time that it became a, a client state of the United States, and so the, but the faith in progress hasn't changed at all. They've just redefined progress so they can keep believing in it. And yeah, it's funny that, there's that old maybe bit. you're gone. That maybe that maybe progress was a temporary phenomenon and is followed in the normal way by decline. The, the idea that history follows cycles, that there's an up and a down, that's blasphemy to them. That's that's the uttermost blasphemous apostasy that you can possibly utter, even though it's what history tells us. And I think one of the reasons so many people are so crazy these days is that they're trying to keep themselves believing in progress when everything they see tells them that's not happening. And they don't have probably ritual and they don't have these kind of like deep rituals 
yeah yeah that have they been, just, they, they, those are taken away from them so they have to they, they substitute that with a pseudo re, 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 religion which is which is kind of like 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 that there's some we're going we're, we're in a linear version of evolution or something yeah exactly they've 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 confused evolution with progress and confused progress with um I watched this on a on a science fiction program on the telly when I was eleven, and so it has to happen. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. come on, but you know it's one of those things. We live in a time where that kind of thing is very common, and where such where that kind of secular faith in progress is a major social force. And I think it'll continue until eventually enough people just have to finally face facts and realize that you know progress is followed by regress and that the age of progress actually ended decades ago we have a few neat new toys but compare that to all the things that are going away and all the things that are in decline and you know that's one of those things but religiosity seems to be on the rise too perhaps mm -hmm. for the same reason because the the decay has be become so transparent mm -hmm. or or well, that's that's normally what happens at this at this phase of of a society in decline. You get people turning back to traditional religion, or, or sometimes new religions also, or, or religions imported from elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, because that's a bulwark against chaos. That's a bulwark against the impact of the decline. You have something else to believe in. If you can't believe in progress anymore, if you can't believe that the Roman Empire is eternal, well, you know, you can maybe worship the gods, or you can join this funny little religion called Christianity that's spreading around. Because that'll give you something to believe in, something that gives your life a, a sense of meaning. And so we're seeing exactly that now in the usual way. People are starting to turn back to religion. They're starting to give up on the, on the, the ersatz religion of progress and look for something, something that, that has a spiritual dimension to it. Because they've, it's starting to sink in. They're not going to get the utopia that they think they were promised. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with that statement and your articulation of it. it seems dead on to me. Mm -hmm. what, what about you, Owen? Oh, well, the big thought that was on my mind when we were talking about Britain a second ago is that there's that old Victorian saying, right, that the man who is bored of London is bored of life. But I hate to say it, I live here and I find it quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think Victorian London was a more interesting place. I think it was. I mean, here it just feels like there's a million restaurants with a slightly different colored light shade and a different variation on some world cuisine served mm -hmm. by an assortment of random people. But mm -hmm. the depth isn't there. It's just it's just trying to make it seem like progress is still happening by tweaking the light bulbs. That's really it. Mm -hmm. We've got our mm -hmm. goth club, we've got our Crowley bar, and I've got the forest by my house, and I'm quite happy with that. You've got a Crowley bar. Yes. I'm delighted <laughs> to hear that. If, if I ever get back to London, I'll, I'll have to visit there. Right? I... <clears throat> oh, it's, it's called Helgi's. It's in Hackney. Uh, no, it's funny, actually. The, uh, the woman who runs it, she's, uh, she's an old Italian witch. And I was talking to her once mm -hmm. and she kind of not winked at me and pointed at the wall behind. And there was a, a, the Golden Dawn emblem on the wall. And she said she mm -hmm. bought this bar. 10 years ago or so to turn it into a bar and then found out a few years later that it had originally a hundred years before been owned and used by members of the golden door. Oh, and I then, know where that is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. So there's a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, if I ever get back to London, I will make a beeline toward it and <clears throat> drink what I will. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a portal there, Owen, you know, and, and all the other, you know, the decadence around you, there's a portal. <laughs> well, I was thinking when you were talking that, yeah, you're bored of London. And I, it seems like the marginal places are the interesting places these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would seem. Yeah. Well, I think, I think really also, you know, in a society decline, it's not the outward things that are going to be the source of interest. It's always what lies within. Yes. Um, I have to say that Rhode Island is not the most thrilling state in the Union. <laughs> it is not a bubbling cauldron of excitement or anything like that. It's a pleasant place to live. But, you know, there's, I have work to do, and I always have something to keep me busy. So, um, so and it I doesn't imagine matter I, so much. Yeah. Even if I lived in London, I could probably find something to do with my time. Right. Yeah. 
I guess it's all about inner resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a delightful conversation. Are we, are, is, is there, do, do you have, um, maybe you want to tell our listeners, you know, what you're up to or, 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 you know, if, if they want. It's just the, the, the very quick, yeah, the very quick form. I have, I have more, I have books coming out all the time. Um, during the, during the shutdown, of course, I had plenty of time to write. And there was also a certain amount of backlog of because, of course, with paper shortage and things like that, a bunch of projects. So I have, um, I, let's see, what do I have coming out at this point? Um, I've just the, the second volume of the Dolman Arch, which is an old Druid revival study course, um, is now out in paperback. Um, the new edition of my book, A World Full of Gods, which is a study of polytheism as a, as a viable religious option. That's going to be out shortly. Um, the first of a new series of novels. I, I got into fiction a few years ago um, by way of H.P. Lovecraft and having fun with tentacled horrors. But this is a new series. This is a series of occult detective stories um, cool. involving. I have a. I have an elderly mage, um, Doctor Doctor Bernard Moravec, and his eighteen-year-old granddaughter. Ariel, who are the, the detectives in this particular game. And so and one of the things about the Occult Detective series is that all the magic in it is real. It's not, this, it's not fantasy fiction crap. It's not your Harry Potter, you know, um, wave a wand and babble something on gra grammatical Latin and some Hollywood special effects happen. It's the kind of magic people actually do. And that's going to continue. Let's see, the first book, <clears throat> The Witch of Criswell, Excuse me, The Witch of Criswell. Um, that'll be out next month, and then the second book in the series. Um, let's see, the Book of Hatan. That will be out next spring, so it should be kind of on an annual basis from here on in. I have a number of books in that series, right? Um, you can always keep track of my. Um, anyone who wants to follow my vagaries can. I have a blog, a weekly blog at. Um, ecosophia.net e-c-o-s-o-p-h-i-a.net or at ecosophia.dreamwith.org is my journal so that's probably the best places to keep track keep tabs cool wonderful great stuff sounds you very know, rich <laughs> just to wrap up as well henrik's written back in the comments uh, thank you mm -hmm. Astrid. lighting the hermit lantern and seeing the sign keep calm and carry on mm-hmm <laughs> <laughs> he says, mm -hmm. hey, it's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Keep that's a nice it. place to wrap. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.